So I started off episode one in kind of a down mood, right? I, I, I listed the episode title as Twisting the Knife because that's what I felt like I was doing. I just kind of piled on to Sens fans' misery by further explaining the situation and explaining how I wasn't really going to help out immediately here in season one. So that brings us here to episode two, and I'm happy to say that things are looking a bit better, despite the fact that we are, of course, last in the Atlantic Division. We would be very much involved in the Rasmus Dahlian sweepstakes if we had our first round pick, which of course we don't. And again, I just wanted to deal with the consequences of that rather than going out and getting that first round pick back from Colorado. Like I said though, despite the overwhelming amount of negatives, Things are looking okay. We have seen progression from our younger players like Chalapic and Logan Brown. Thomas Shabbat is continuing to improve on defense while Landon has improved. That's what this season was about, getting some solid progression out of the guys that we already had on the roster, which we pretty much set ourselves up to fail by going with the weaker roster and sending guys like uh, He Who Shall Not Be Named down to the AHL, also Borbietsky as well. We kind of intentionally sabotaged this season, which is fine. Again, it was about progression. And now this episode, it's still about progression, as we'll sim through the rest of Season 1. I also plan on going through the draft in this episode as far as whether or not I make it through the entire offseason. Time will tell. But while it's still about progression, we are going to look to make some changes here. Of course, we stopped... On deadline day, I still have a little bit of time to make some moves, and at the very least, there is one trade that I've kind of set up here, and it, it comes from looking at the contract situation, looking at who hasn't been re-signed yet for next season. And as we take a look at that, we do have to worry about re-signing Mark Stone, but he's an RFA, so that shouldn't be an issue. There's also Cody Cece, who I'm okay with re-signing, especially because we should be able to use the 85% trick with him wanting an extension. But that brings me to someone like Chris Weidman, who I would love to have on our third pairing next season. However, he is looking for quite a bit of money and doesn't exactly want to uh, re-sign with us. So... Taking a look at that, and also looking through every other name here, I have come up with a trade, and also Philip All, he is over, or he is 20 years old, but he's also on an SHL team, that's why he shows up as a UFA right now, we'll have to worry about signing him at the re-sign phase, which isn't a big deal. Now, while I am going to focus on trying to get Stone re-signed, the first thing we have to do, since it is deadline day of course, is get this trade out of the way. Like I mentioned in the first episode, when it comes to guys like Blundine, Randall, Reinhardt, I'm not too worried about trading them just because their contracts are expiring. Because let's be honest, I'm going to trade them for sixth, maybe fifth round pick, seventh at the worst. And then I'll probably just move those picks again at the draft because the odds of us finding somebody helpful with those picks are incredibly low, seeing as it's the first year draft. So that, that would just be getting draft picks for the sake of getting draft picks and then probably moving them again in the future. I don't really have much interest in that. But with someone like Weidman and as well Nick Mutri is the other piece that I'm looking to move here. I was taking a look at the Dallas Stars. They're in a playoff race. They don't have a ton of cap space. But they could use some defensive insurance in form of Chris Weidman. Even though they have also acquired Jason Garrison at some point in the recent future. I will take a look at all the other trades that were made before we continue on with the sim. Now, I don't exactly have a set plan of who I want to acquire in this deal, as I just completely looked past Weidman there. And I also need to find one Nick Moutry, who, thanks to the medium top nine, at least has some value, as opposed to someone like Jim O'Brien. But Moutry, he'll more than likely become a fourth-line guy but you look at his offensive abilities, he's only going to be good for physical play. And with our fourth line, I'd prefer someone to actually be a little bit capable of putting up points, which I don't exactly think that he will be. So we are going to look to move Weidman and Moutry to Dallas. Again, they don't have much in terms of cap space, but they have a winning record. They have contract spots. It seems like a pretty good fit. Uh, like a pretty good fit. And if Weidman resigns in Dallas, it's not that big of a deal. 
Now, taking a look at the players that are available on their block, just because they would be the easiest to acquire, you do have someone like Riley Tufty. Honka would be a great addition to this team, especially you know considering the fact that we're giving away a defenseman in this trade. They also have Ottinger and Colton Point. Point would be a very good goaltending prospect to pick up, but I think the value might just be a little bit too high. But you know what? I'm not... I mean, see, we would have to give up something more here. And I'm just not sure if it's worth giving up a second round pick. I mean, it might be. I don't know if we're going to find a medium starter goalie if we necessarily need one, which, I mean, we do. You know, we do have Gustafson, who is a medium starter, but obviously the value is a little bit lower as his overall is a little bit lower. So while, Col uh, while Colton Point would be a half-decent addition, I am leaning towards trying to trade for Julius Honka as opposed to getting Riley Tufty, who is, of course, involved in the ongoing USA Nations United series. So whether or not we can get Honka, I think we'll be able to pull this off. We are going to have to add a little bit more to this deal to make this happen which hopefully it's not a hell of a lot more to make this happen. I'm willing to give up our fourth round pick next year. I don't know. That won't be enough still. Oh, even though they want to trade Honka and they're all right with getting back Weidman, I'm wondering what more it will take. Of course, we did just pick up Shore on waivers. I'm kind of cool with keeping him, though. He's a pretty well-rounded player from the University of Maine as well, so why would I not keep him? Oh, let's see. Now, they do have someone like Pyatt and Burroughs, both of whom they're interested in, but I'm not sure if they're really going to add that much more to the value. Zach Smith, they wouldn't be able to take that cap hit. Same with Gabarik. But sending Shore right back to Dallas and then him potentially being on waivers again... That is a possibility. A very cheap move on my part, but it is a possibility. Adding Shore to this deal and sending him back to Dallas and potentially picking him or Moutry right back up on waivers. That could happen. I mean, here's the thing. Even if I send them Nick Moutry, odds are someone ends up on waivers. I just, I wonder, for the hell of it, will that go through? No, it won't. Okay, so even with Shore's added value we're still not quite there now getting honka back in this deal isn't the biggest concern i'm all right with getting someone like robertson at least getting someone back for weidman since we know we're not going to re-sign him and to be honest pittsburgh their third round pick next year we know it's going to be a low pick so i'm not against using it in this deal again honk is a 76 overall at 22 years old should easily be able to replace weidman within the season will that go through no, it won't. And they're still not that interested. Right. Well, how about the fifth round pick next year as well? All right. I don't think we're getting Julius Honka because I don't want to give up too much here in terms of value. Again, that Pittsburgh pick, it isn't going to be that good, but I'm still not wanting to sacrifice it. I'm going to be stingy and I'm going to make sure that I come up on the winning ends of these trades. So we have Robertson and we have Rup Heinz. It might be Hints, but I'm pretty sure it's Heinz. Which, I guess the question is, will Robertson improve by eight overall points within three years? I'm going to say he is. I'm going to, I'll take that bet. And we'll see if Jason Robertson is acquirable here in this deal. And to be honest, he very well might be. Uh, let's go ahead and tack on, I mean, both Chicago and Dallas are good teams. Let's use the Dallas fourth round pick as a safety net. So it's still rejected. Let's go for the sixth, just to test this out. And there we go. That will go through. So let's try the fifth round pick here instead. And there we go. Now, see, I know what I said about not wanting to acquire too many picks. I'm t like one fifth round pick isn't much. But again, I'm talking in terms of like Blundin, Bergdorfer, Randall trading all of those guys for picks. That's overkill and unnecessary. But getting back one fifth round pick just to even out the value. I mean, the main target here is Robertson, as opposed to just low-end picks to free up roster spots. Which really, who cares? We're going to be letting go of most of those guys anyway. 
and it would be low on picks. I don't need to explain that decision. You guys get it. Weidman and Moutry for Jason Robertson and a fifth. We are going to complete this trade with Dallas. Again, I really like Chris Weidman. I'd be cool with keeping him. Not for $3 million when he cannot improve beyond where he already is. And as a result, hmm, Borowiecki would be the easy call-up. However, someone like Jaros, Harper, or even Vili Polka, just because, again, that low top, you know, I'm going to give Vili, uh, uh, I mean, here's the thing, though. If I call it Borowiecki, Vili Polka will get top line time in the AHL, which might be better for him than NHL time. You know, I am going to call it Borowiecki, just to replace Weidman. That works out. And then, of course, the other move was at the AHL level. Now, one thing that I want to note here is that injuries have been turned on for this episode. We'll see how it plays out, but injuries are indeed on for this episode. I'm intrigued to see how that all plays out, as I'm going to actually drop Clayson down to the third pairing. I'm intrigued to see how that plays out, especially some, with someone like Marion Gabrick, who again has 65 durability. Uh, there was some debate where to put that injury slider. I put it at 10. I've typically gone with 9. That seemed to be the magic number. Uh, I've gone with 9 typically in the past, but we have gone with the 10 out of 100 on that slider. So we'll see how that works out. Now, I don't really know who the hell should go in the lineup here, to be honest. Uh, let's bring in Max Reinhardt, I suppose. And on defense, you know what? Best lines, screw it. I'll just fix it up really quick. As uh, Bergdorfer is actually going to be the one that we should take out. And we're going to go with LaJoy in the lineup this time out. Let's take a look at the values. That works itself out. And then offensively, let's fix this up really quick. Bring in Francis Perron. Again, we will, we will look at the other moves that were made by other teams and I'm also going to work on resigning players of course Stone is the main player of concern that's why I mentioned that you know I'm not sure where we'll get in this episode because there is a whole lot to do so we'll play Burroughs, Luchik and Blunden, Randall O'Brien, Roadwall that works actually Power forward two way. I thought we had another power forward. That's actually perfect. Uh, let's just make that swap. We'll have Reinhardt with Colin White. They should be a pretty solid pairing together. And then I need to take out Marcus Hogberg for Gustafson to make sure that he still gets some starts. So that is our one deal completed. It took a little bit longer than I would have expected. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what other deals were made here course there might actually you know it here let, let me worry about the re-signing because there might be a last minute deal on deadline day made by these teams so let me go ahead and go back to contracts and we'll be doing the old 85 percent deal with stone cc and whoever else is really worth re-signing we'll sim a day and then we'll take a look uh, chris dreger i'm not going to bring him back so we're not going to worry about that cody cc we are going to look to bring him back it's it's a hell of a contract he's asking for, but of course with the 85% trick, we can knock it down to 3.7, which for a second pairing defenseman who still might get a little bit better, maybe, that's not that bad. Clayson, now he's not the best third pairing defenseman. I don't think he'll improve by all that much. He's not looking for an extension either, but I'm gonna try to bring him back for one year and exactly what he's asking for. I mean, he's asking for a million less than Weidman. Of course, Weidman is two overall points better, but again, Weidman asking for three, that's that's just a little bit much, especially when you consider the top four is shaping up to be Carlson, CC, Shabbat, and Willannon. That's kind of my plan as far as that goes. Now, if we, for example, had committed to the idea of trading Eric Carlson, which... You know, we're still up in the air about that. We still have him under contract for another year. We'll see what happens. Had we committed to that idea, then sure, paying Weidman what he wants would not be a big deal at all. But let's see here. Man, if I can get Stone on, I'll, I'll even go for one year. I'm fine with that. We can get that to 5-3-7-5 five, five 
That's a beautiful contract. And again, if we do trade Carlson, then Stone will be one of the big... I mean, we're going to pay him regardless, but it'll be that much easier to feel good about paying him. Uh, Nick Paul. Did he want to re-sign? He does. Perfect. The loyalty from Nick Paul. I love it. I showed some loyalty in not trading him, and now he wants to come back to Ottawa, which is beautiful. Try to get him on a two-year deal. Again, Philip All. He is basically locked out for this season. I'll be able to sign him for next. Uh, Devin Shore. Did he want to re-sign? He does, which is beautiful. Let's see what we can drop that down to. Basically 1.1, but I'm okay with that. And Max Reinhardt will be let go. So the first batch of offers have been taken care of. Let's go ahead and sim this game against Washington. What are the odds that we suffer an injury in our first game with injuries on? As Greg Paterin is on waivers. Of course, I knew Dallas would send somebody down. I will gladly claim him for the rest of the year. It's fine by me. Shockingly, we didn't suffer an injury, and we beat Washington 4-2. to two. So let's go ahead and take a look at what other teams uh, went ahead and did. There were not any other deals aside from ours. James Neal is off to the Jets. Of course, he was moved earlier this year to Arizona, and now the Coyotes have flipped him to Cup Contenders Winnipeg for Christian Veselin in a first and a second. So a high price for James Neal. But think about the Winnipeg Jets roster, and then think of them with James Neal as well. That first and second, they're going to be late picks. Christian Veselin is a strong prospect, but that's a really good deal for the Winnipeg Jets. The LA Kings acquire Benoit Pouliot and a sixth for a third and a fourth. So some depth there for the Kings. Chicago gets Kyle Okpozo for defensive prospect Dennis Gilbert, a second and third. So not the highest price for Okpozo, but a decent addition for the Blackhawks. Kyle Okpozo to Chicago. How is that going to affect them, though, in terms of the salary cap? That's what I want to know. Of course, we traded Patrick Seeloff, uh, Marcus Nermy, and three others for a second round pick. I'm trying to remember who they wanted in that trade. I honestly can't remember, though. Uh, Vegas gets a third and a sixth from Chicago for Derek Anglin, Luke Shen, and a sixth. So some defensive depth there for the Blackhawks, which they needed. The Florida Panthers get Calvin DeHaan and Dennis Seidenberg for, I believe it's Max Gilden, Jace Howardick, and a second. I know I'm butchering uh, the other guy's name. Not Gilden. I know I'm butchering the other guy's name, though. So Calvin DeHaan goes for a second. Not a bad pickup for Florida. Dallas gets David Perron and Jason Garrison. So see, I didn't even notice that they had David Perron. In return, they get a first, or in return, Vegas gets a first, second, and Karjalainen. So, a high price there for David Perron, but not all that surprising. The Islanders get Jeremy Bracco in a seventh in exchange for Josh Bailey and Brandon Davidson. So, the Maple Leafs picking up Josh Bailey, a strong addition, especially if they're going for the cup. Edmonton gets Resignan, a fourth and a fifth for Mike Camilleri in a seventh. I'm pretty sure we already saw that trade. Lucas Spiza was moved, the Goligoski deal. Yeah, we already saw those, but there you go. And then there is the Magnus Pyarvi trade. So some big names on the move, as I need to add Greg Paterin to probably the AHL lineup. I think I'll just keep him there. And I'm probably gonna just take out Wickstrand. Why not? We'll go with the better option here. Let's add Paterin. And he can play with LaJoy on the third pairing. So that works out pretty well. So not exactly what I planned. You could argue I should put Paterin... Actually, hmm. Uh, I mean, it's not like Borowiecki is going to be claimed on waivers or anything. You know, I'll, I'll leave him for now. You could argue we should go with a better option, especially considering we don't own our first round pick. And it would probably be for the best to make sure that's as good a pick as possible, but I'm not all that concerned. As Devin Shore has accepted our extension, Mark Stone is back as well. Cody Cece accepts, Frederick Clayson rejects, Billy Polka and Nick Paul have both accepted. Uh, we'll revisit an offer to Clayson once this uh, round of simming is done. We have less than a week to go on that as we continue to trade wins and losses. March has always been a very weird month for me, at least in terms of simming with NHL 18, as Borowiecki is down for roughly a week. 
so there we go. We will call up Paterin here in this deal, and upon return, Borbietsky will be sent down, more than likely, or maybe I'll just leave him as a healthy scratch. I'm not quite sure yet. So let's see again. We're going to want to swap them around. That works. Uh, as was pointed out in the comments, something that will affect the series is the fact that Ryan Dezingle is a bit underrated. He simply is. Uh, like I mentioned too in the US, uh, the most recent US episode, not every player had that perfect amount of attention, you know, dedicated, like a ton of time dedicated to their attributes. If I saw that they were in a range where they probably should be, nothing was really changed. Uh, that was just for the sake of time, because again, if I wanted to sit here and make sure that everyone's attributes were as close to perfect as they could be, odds are neither of the two series currently ongoing would have started yet. So, unfortunately, I can fully admit that someone like Ryan Dezingle is a little bit underrated, but these things happen. So let's bump up Vili Polka. And again, having to set up the AHL lineups is probably going to be a tad bit tedious, but at least I know basically everyone that I want in the lineup. Although, I'm thinking, at this point, I'm not going to reorder this, especially if the team's not at 100%, I'm just going to make sure uh, who I want in the lineup is actually playing, and then we'll continue on. But let's revisit the contract talks, as we are ahead of Buffalo now in the standings, which, if we want to get revenge on Joe Sackick in Colorado, it might work out. Actually, I do wonder, what's, what's Paterin looking for? I mean, that's that's not bad. I There's a decent chance I'm going to send Paterin an offer. Actually, here. Um, wants extension, yes. Wants extension, no. So I could go for Clayson at $2 million, which, again, is still a significant amount less than what Weidman wanted. Even though Weidman is two overall points better, you could argue whether or not I should have paid Chris Weidman. Uh, two million is about the highest I'm going now for Clayson as a third pairing guy, especially when you factor in who might be on the free agent list. So we'll see if he accepts. If not, we will revisit this at the actual resign phase as to whether or not we're going to keep him. Uh, but for now, let's move on. And then, of course, we do have the option to keep Paterin if we decide that that's the better way to go. But, yeah, he rejected again. All right. So, I don't know how much money he's expecting to get as Mark Stone goes down to a mild concussion. Again, the injury slider is at 10. And already we got players picking up some knocks here. Uh, I don't want to call up Shore because I don't want to risk losing him. So, Blunden, Blundin is getting the call up. So, let's go ahead and do that so we'll go best lines it's now Hoffman Duchesne Ryan I'm actually gonna go with hmm you know what? yeah I'm all right with Gabrick being on the left I'm shocked I I thought for sure that Gabrick would have been the first guy injured like I thought it was a near guarantee but apparently not as we'll have Nick Paul on the third line in terms of the AHL, we'll just... Oh, boy. Well, again, go past lines. <laughs> All right. It's fine. No worries. It's a test run just to see how crazy it is. Again, we can easily turn injuries back off. Uh, we can do what 2BC has done for years upon years now in terms of just having uh, injuries on for the playoffs, which when are we going to be in the playoffs <laughs> is probably the better question. But with this game, you never quite know. This could be a pretty big offseason for us. Right, let me get LaJoy back into the lineup, and there we go. That's good to go. So, like I said, we'll keep it fairly simple in terms of not setting everything up properly. Borvietsky is 100%. I'm just going to leave him as a healthy scratch right now. I'm not all that concerned about getting him into the lineup. Once Stone is back here, though, which he is, then we'll fix everything up. So, back to roster moves. And you know what? I think I'm actually just going to leave the two guys there. Uh, Blundin and Borowiecki. I'm going to leave them as the healthy scratches. Just for the sake of time. 
So let's see again. We have Pyatt, Smith, and Paul. Zingle. Actually, yeah, we'll have the Zingle Ground Shalapic still. Actually, I gotta flip those two around. Defense, swap those guys around. Well, Lannon's up to a 77, which is pretty promising. So again, someone like Clayson, solid option, but how much am I willing to pay you? Just how much am I willing to pay you when we do have some fringe options that could play third pairing next year? The free agent market could be pretty decent for us. It's it's tough. I mean, hey, if he thinks he can go to the free agent list, to the free agent market, and make more than two million a year, by all means, you go right ahead and try. But you're certainly not going to get it from the Ottawa Senators at this rate. As we reach April 1st, the Sens with a 27, 40, and 11 record, certainly not playoff bound. The Belleville Sens as well. I was going to say the Senators, and I just decided, eh, let's just say Sens. They're not exactly playoff bound either, so we'll be getting to the draft here fairly quickly. As uh, You know what? Why, why waste time? Let's just sim to the last day of the season. Actually, we'll sim to the 8th, where it should all be over and done with in terms of the regular season sim and Cody CC fractures his collarbone tremendous uh, let's just go actually you know what I do want to go best lines but I need to make sure that Blunden is not in the lineup for Chalapic so let's move them back around and that's good to go defense is now Let's go Willannon and I'll, I'll play Paterin there just to give him a better shot at potentially making an impact and proving that he deserves a spot here next year. Although, of course, I'm not expecting his stats to be that strong. He's playing on one of the worst teams, if not the worst team in the league, as we drop our last three games, including a 7-1 loss to Pittsburgh and a 2-0 shutout loss in Boston. So we finish this season, season one, with a 28, 42, and 12 record. The Belleville Sens were 37, 38, and 7 again, not expecting them to make the postseason unless those overtime losses really help them out. As Tampa, Boston, and Toronto are the only three representatives from the Atlantic Division, which you could argue is quite realistic, actually. Although Tampa killed it, nearly a 60-win season in the books. Let's go ahead and take a look at all of the stats and numbers before simming through the playoffs. So again, Tampa had a dominant year. Uh, Florida, Montreal, Detroit, Buffalo, and we finished below the Sabres. So in terms of how that played out, not too bad. Not too bad. I'd say EA got the sim quite right. Over in the Metro, and it might be a slightly different story, as the Carolina Hurricanes win the division, Pittsburgh, Columbus, New Jersey, and Washington all make the playoffs. The Islanders uh, just miss out. The Rangers missed out by a lot. The Philadelphia Flyers had an awful season. You know, if you swap Philadelphia with Carolina, maybe not in terms of winning the division, but at least in terms of making the playoffs, it would look quite realistic. But Carolina had a great year, which means Scott Darling may have been affected by the jumping up to an 89 overall effect. I won't even call it a glitch. It's just something that happens in this game from time to time. We'll have to check out Philly and Carolina. In the Atlantic, there's nothing to really check out. Over in the Central, Dallas, Nashville, Chicago, Winnipeg, and Minnesota all make the playoffs. It was a rough year for Colorado and St. Louis which is a little bit surprising, I'd say, especially to Dallas making the playoffs. I'm not surprised that Chicago did well. Again, they went out and got some defensive help. They also had Corey Crawford basically all year. That's a very big factor into why the Blackhawks struggled so much this year. Of course, was their goaltending. And then in the Pacific, Anaheim, LA, and San Jose, the California clean sweep. Edmonton, Vancouver, Arizona, Vegas, and Calgary miss out. I'm not surprised Vegas missed out because, again, they traded away James Neal and David Perron. Can't really be all that surprised with that result. The Tampa Bay Lightning, the Boston Bruins, and the Toronto Maple Leafs, actually the top three teams in the league. At the bottom of the standings, though, we secured the worst record in the NHL by tiebreaker over Buffalo. So, Colorado, you're welcome. We may have just handed you Rasmus Dahlin. We definitely handed you a very strong player, even though they had a pretty poor season as well. 
and indeed Belleville missed out on the playoffs by at least nine points. Actually, we'll take a look at the AHL lay of the land as the Lehigh Valley Phantoms dominated this season. So let's take a look at the player stats. Of course, we'll look at our team first as Mike Hoffman led the way with 69 points, 29 goals. Eric Carlson with 63 points. Matt Duchesne, solid season, 59 points on a bad team. Stone, only 50 points. Of course, he missed those three games. Gabarik, 37 points. And look, Marion Gabarik, if he's fully healthy, is that 100%? Can he still put up 37 points in the NHL? I'd probably say yes. Of course, I'm shocked that he wasn't injured in the last month of the season with injuries being on. Bobby Ryan... 84 overall, but boy, did he just not have it this season. 33 points. 25 points for Zach Smith. Logan Brown at 23. Pajo at 23 on the second line. That's that's a little bit rough. Zingle, 20 points. Or Zingle, whatever. Pyatt with 20 points. Shabbat, 20 points. Colin White at 16. Of course, we sent him down midway through the season. Cody CC Shore had 8 points in 59 games. Not really sure if it was worth re-signing him. Or should I say, not really sure if it was, I'm sorry. Uh, Chalapic, 7 points in 34 games. Well, Lannon, 5 points in all 82 games, as you'll get a look at the rest of the players involved. Goaltending-wise, I mean, Anderson, he's behind a weak defense, and he certainly didn't do that well. Mike Condon with a 916 save percentage in 23 appearances. We had one shutout all year. One shutout all year that is incredibly rough as i wanted to take a look at montreal as you get a look at their point breakdown actually you know what here this is what i'll do i'm not going to look at every team in depth i'm definitely not going to look at the goaltenders but here you go in case you want to see who the top scorers were and hey if you don't see someone listed there that means they didn't do that well so i do want to scroll through until I get to teams that I'm interested in checking out. Um, which Toronto's an interesting one. In terms of goaltending, Freddie Anderson was a monster. McElhaney actually struggled, though. Were there any goaltenders on the other teams I was intrigued by? Uh, not really. I'm, I'm sure that Holtby, he still had a somewhat down season for, uh, you know, considering who he is and how good he is, but uh, nothing, uh, nothing like the real life struggles that he's had this season. As St. Louis struggled, I did want to take a look at their goaltending. Yeah, Allen and Hutton really struggled this year. That would explain why the Blues had such a rough season. As you get a look at San Jose again, if you want to see your team in depth, all you got to do is pause the video. Philly was a team that I was really interested by and why they struggled so much. 60 points for Voracek and Giroux. Couturier only put up 54 points. That's not too bad. Ghost Bear, Simmons... Philip Konechny, Latero put up 31 points. Huh. Nolan Patrick with 25 points in his rookie year. It was the goaltending that absolutely sunk them, which, surprise, surprise, the Philadelphia team, or at least the Flyers team, happened to be sunk by bad goaltending. Color me shocked. So we get a look at the Devils, the Preds. Ryan Johansson put up 60 points, leading the way for that team. It looks like goal scoring was just flat out down throughout the league this season, which can happen randomly, of course. Edmonton McDavid put up 84 points. I imagine we'll be seeing him towards the top of the list. Actually, Sagan, never mind. Sagan at 96 points. Sagan and Ben absolutely killed it. Nathan McKinnon had a great year. Uh, let's see, again, Chicago, Saad put up 80, uh, 85, he put up 65 points at an 84 overall. Carolina, it has to be the goaltending, right? <sighs> I don't know how Carolina did so well. 915 and a 919 for Darling and Ward, respectively. I don't understand how Carolina did so well. That is classic EA voodoo, if I have ever seen it. But what are you going to do? It's Pasternak put up 87 points. You absolute beauty. And then we get to Anaheim as well. So let's take a look league-wide as Sagan and Ben dominated. Sagan, Ben, and Radulov. Dallas' top line, the top three goal scorers, and the only three players to break 90 points. All three of them put up at least 30 goals as well. What a season 
for them. No real surprising names this high up on the list, aside from maybe, uh, aside from maybe Nico Hischer, but you also see Taylor Hall there at the bottom. So of course, you know, it's not surprising to see that tandem listed. Vander Kane was up there. I'm going to take a look at the goal scoring as well. Connor McDavid, the only guy to break 50. He puts up 52 goals. Ovi at 46, McKinnon at 44, and Tarasenko at 40. So only four players break the 40 goal mark this season. Interesting stuff. Best plus minus was P.K. Subban. The penalty minute king, Jake Dotchin. No surprise. I don't know what it is. I do not know what it is because if you look at the physical category, uh, Chris Thorburn has him beat. I guess it's just the amount of ice time he has as a third pairing guy it would be more than Thorburn, uh, Thorburn on the fourth line. But yeah, damn. Let's take a look at the power play goal. King, Stamkos, Obi, the top two. Shorthanded goal, King better be Marchand. It's not. It's Curtis Lazar. Interesting. Uh, let's take a look here. The most minutes the NHL's Iron Man was Nick Letty. Pretty crazy. Face-offs one for the hell of it. Jonathan Taves. I'd expect to see him win the Selkie then because of that more than likely. The hit king was Jonathan Taves. Interesting. The most blocked shots went to Colton Pareko. The most giveaways, Danny DeKaiser. And the most takeaways, Mark Stone, which is actually fairly realistic. He is one of the better defensive forwards, especially in terms of takeaways in the NHL. As we get a look at the fights, Jake Dodgson. No real surprise. Down in the AHL. Down in the AHL. Curtis McDermott led the way in terms of fights. The point leader was Nick Merkley. Evgeny Svechnikov was up there. Kasperi Kapanen. Leas Anderson put up 71 points. It's not too bad. Sonny Milano was 68. It's not too shabby. It's not too shabby. Now, I imagine some people are saying, well, what about uh, NHL rookie scoring? Uh, of course, the glitch is still in the game where if you edit anybody 26 or younger, they default to rookie status. How that's a glitch in this game, again, I went on this rant so many times, how that's a glitch in this game this year, but it wasn't in previous, I don't know. Tyler Sagan will win the Calder in terms of of actual rookie scoring, consider Nico Hischer the Calder winner this year because he absolutely would have been. So that takes care of that. The look at everything, the season one wrap up, and you can see now why I was hesitant to say that I would get through the entire off season. I think we will just leave it at the draft. So let's move forward. We'll take a look at the postseason bracket before simming through it all. And in terms of re-signing anybody, I'm going to wait until the re-sign phase. So let's take a look. The playoff favorite would be the Tampa Bay Lightning. Over in the West, it's Nashville, Chicago again. Dallas and Winnipeg, LA and San Jose, Anaheim and Minnesota. In the East, Pittsburgh, Columbus again. Carolina, New Jersey, Boston, Toronto again. And Tampa against Washington. So we will see who makes it out of those first few matchups. As we'll sim forward here, we got nothing left to play for. Both teams are outside of the playoff structure. Of course, we'll take a look at the progress reports. Or the progress reports. I will say, I am recording this having only been up for about 20 minutes. So if uh, if I'm stumbling over everything, hey, I'm doing what I got to do to bring this series to you guys because hey, the support on the first episode uh, was tremendous, and I thank you guys for that. And also, it's been a day or two since I've uploaded the USA series. Has taken a little bit of the priority as we move on through here don't know why i'm going day by day i really should just be simming until the end so let me do that but yeah we'll take a look at the progress reports of course once everything is settled it's the best time to look at it because there, there still can be slight changes after a champion is crowned which there has been who has won the stanley cup in year one it's the chicago blackhawks because of course it is. Bridgeport Sound Tigers win the Calder Cup, but the Chicago Blackhawks win it all in year one. The power of adding some defensive depth and having Corey Crawford for the entire season, I do suppose, as we'll get the playoff wrap up done and dusted before taking a look at the progress reports and then we focus solely on the draft. 
So Chicago beat Nashville in five in the first round. Winnipeg beat Dallas in five. San Jose beats LA in seven. Of course, that series won seven. And Anaheim beat Minnesota in six. Second round, Chicago beats Winnipeg in six. Anaheim beats San Jose in five. In the Western Conference final, Chicago sweeps Anaheim. Over in the East, Pittsburgh outlasts Columbus in seven. New Jersey beats Carolina in five. Toronto beats Boston in five, which wouldn't surprise me if that happened in real life. And Tampa beats Washington in six. Second round, Pittsburgh over New Jersey in six. Tampa over Toronto in six. And in the Eastern Conference final, Pittsburgh beat Tampa in seven, setting up just, oh God, you could imagine how disappointed the NHL, the, the hockey community would be to have a Chicago-Pittsburgh final in 2018, which thankfully cannot happen at this point. But Chicago does win in the video game world in seven games. The Blackhawks deny the three-peat and continue their own dynasty. And in the AHL Caller Cup final, Bridgeport over San Diego in seven. You guys can, of course, pause to take a look at that full bracket if you care to. Let's take a look at the Blackhawks just to see how different this team is compared to their real-life counterparts. So Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves absolutely killed it. Alex DeBrincat up to an 84, 17 points. Only three goals, but 17 points in 22 games. Okpozo did very well for them. Eight goals, 14 points in that playoff run. Schmaltz with 13, Saad with 11 despite the fact that he led that team in scoring in the regular season. <laughs> Magnus Pajarvi, you're welcome. You are welcome, sir. I trade you to Chicago to open up a roster spot, and he wins the Stanley Cup. <laughs> Magnus Pajarvi is my number one fan. Anthony Duclair, Boma, Yurko, and Hina Stroza, who only played three games. On defense, it's Duncan Keith, Connor Murphy, Jan Aruta, Cody Franzen, played a couple of games. Oesterle didn't play that much, but Shen did. So really, their defense is basically the same, with the exception of Braden Shen, or uh, Braden Shen, Luke Shen, being added to the team. I was going to say Brent Seabrook had no points, and I'm like, uh, let me make my point about Shen. I'm like, uh, b -b -b Braden Shen. You get the point. Goaltender Corey Crawford, good lord. 950 save percentage, lost six games in 22 like I said, it's the Corey Crawford effect, clearly. Taking a look at the awards, again, spoiler alert, the Calder will be going to Tyler Sagan, but there you go. The last four cups, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, and Chicago. The President's Trophy went to Tampa. That trophy continues to be cursed. Actually didn't want to go down to the AHL, wanted to hit the trigger. The Art Ross goes to Tyler Sagan. No surprise there whatsoever. The Hart goes to Jamie Benn. The Norris Trophy goes to Tory Krug. Kruger. Tory Krug. Now, I'm a little bit shocked about this, despite the fact that I controversially gave him a somewhat high rating. Uh, I certainly didn't make him the best defenseman in the game. I didn't put him into Carlson Hedman territory or Drew Doughty territory, but Tory Krug wins the Norse, even Brent Burns territory. Sagan wins the Lady Bing. Sagan, of course, wins the Calder. We'll give that to Nico Hischer, of course. Con Smythe goes to Corey Crawford. Who else would it have gone to? The Vesna goes to Freddie Anderson. The Jennings goes to Vasileski and Doming. The Masterton to Danny DeKaiser. The Selkie to Jonathan Taves. Jamie Benn wins the Ted Lindsay Award. And the Rocket Richard goes to Connor McDavid. Down in the AHL, Nick Merkley put up the most points. The league MVP was Casper Kapitan. The goal scoring king was the Hobie Baker Award winning Adam Gaudet. So there you go, Gaudet putting up the most goals in the AHL. Kasperi Kapitan was the Rookie of the Year. Kevin Miller was played in the AHL all year. Of course, due to the lack of injuries, I would assume. And he was the best defenseman in the AHL. Andrew Hammond was Goaltender of the Year. Okay, that's all I have to say to that. And Chris Gibson was the MVP of the playoffs, leading the way between the pipes for the Bridgeport Sound Tigers. So there you go. The awards... The playoffs, as they panned out, the last thing we have to do is take a look at our progress reports, which of course was the main thing we focused on this season. So, of course, you know, someone like Carlson and Hoffman are actually better than they are, you know, currently showing up as. Bobby Ryan's a point down. The only thing I'm focused on are greens. Thomas Shabbat, five point improvement, two and 82 overall. Logan Brown with six points improvement, up to an 80. 
What else do we have here? What else do we have? Christian Wallanen up three points to a 77. Not too shabby. And three-point improvement for Philip Chalapic up to a 76 at 21 years old. It's not too bad. In the system, Ben Harper went up to a 76. Colin White's up to a 75. Nick Paul's up to a 75. We have Billy Polka up to a 74. Jaros? Jaros or Jaros? Up to a 74. Roadwall improved by two, but he's not going to be hanging around. Wickstrand up by two. Again, not a big deal. Same thing for Dreger. Gabriel Gagne up two points to a 70. Three-point improvement for Francis Perron. Four-point improvement for Drake Batherson, who will be playing in the AHL next season. Nothing for Hogberg. Aaron Luchik, three points improvement. And Philip All, who didn't play also. Three-point improvement for him. And Jordan Hallett goes up by two. Wow, how many players do we have here? I think you can kind of tell I'm caught off guard. Parker Kelly goes up by one. Jason Robertson, who we acquired from Dallas, goes up by two. And Gustafson improves by one. So quite a few greens, not that much major improvement in the AHL, but at the NHL level, a lot of those guys did benefit from that extra ice time. So as we move forward towards the draft, the next thing to look forward to, of course, is the lottery results, I guess. Let's see if we handed Colorado a number one pick. We did not. So Colorado falls to the fourth pick, where they'll more than likely end up with Zadinia or Kachuk, whoever, whoever Buffalo doesn't pick is who they will end up with. But the St. Louis Blues get the number one overall pick. The Islanders, thanks to the Travis Hamannick trade, get the number two overall pick. And then Thomas Tatar hands Detroit the ninth overall selection. As we'll take a look at the retired players. As far as the trade block, I'm not really sure how I want to set it up. Of course, year one, I don't expect anybody major to retire. Jerome McGinley, he signed with Winnipeg. I don't think he played. Pretty sure he didn't. Matt Cullen retires, and never mind. Despite the fact that in real life he signed a one-year extension, Zidane Chara retires at the end of year one, finishing with 200 career goals and 420 assists. You could say he had a blazing slap shot. Chris Kelly retires as well. Tom Gilbert, Henrik Talinder. It really kind of drops off there in terms of bigger names. Nate Ginnon and Tim Conboy. In terms of goaltenders, Backstrom, Michael Layton, the only guy actually signed. So, shockingly, a big name does retire in year one, that being Zdeno Chara. Now, in terms of the draft, what I think I'm going to do, especially too because we don't have that many important draft picks, is I am going to leave the block completely open. Of course, if you've watched me play this game on Twitch, of course, you know, as I'm going to continue to say the word of course for no reason whatsoever, you'll know that this game has a tendency to lock up when you do this in the regular season. Throughout the draft, though, I haven't really, I haven't really seen it cause that big of an issue. You watch the game will crash now because I said that. I'm actually probably going to save the game uh, before we enter the draft just in case but I'm intrigued to see what offers we get and if there are any interesting offers uh, for any of our bigger players I mean about time I get an offer for Bobby Ryan Marion Gabrick or even Eric Carlson I will be uh, more than likely to accept we'll see though depends on what the full offer is but there we go we are we are open for business come to me with an offer and we'll see what happens. Allow me to save this, though, because I don't want to risk it. As the Avalanche have Eric Johnson on the block, Giordano, TJ Brody, and Backlund are all on the block. The Calgary Flames are looking to make moves. Gustav Nyquist was there as well. So let's do this. It is draft time. As promised, it took us a little bit longer to get there than I would have expected. But let's see what happens here. The number one overall pick is, I mean, spoiler alert, it's going to be Rasmus Dahlin. It's fairly obvious. But let's go ahead. And, I mean, in terms of trading up or anything like that, I don't really have plans to do so because we're, I mean, I'm not going to give up Brown, Shabbat, or White to make it happen. Cody Cece might be able to fetch us a second round pick, but I'm not really expecting that to work out tremendously. I mean, we really don't have the pieces to trade up at this point in time. Looking at our actual draft pick situation, we do have the 30th overall selection. 
we have the 44th and then from there it really drops off so there might be a chance that I trade up uh, to a, a higher pick in the second round because there is a guarantee of there being a low top four or a low top six just because of the way I've seen the draft play out there's a decent chance of us trading up to get somebody uh Kraftsoff is one of those players I'm going to be looking at of course if you're not familiar with that name in terms of rookie scoring among KHL players in the playoffs yeah he, he was actually outscoring Tolvanen from Nashville so that could be someone worth looking at uh, but in terms of trying to make a big play, trading up in the first round, I don't really see. I mean, I, I mean it might work out, maybe, in terms of packaging the Pittsburgh first with the fifth and the sixth and seventh rounders. <laughs> like, that might work out. We might be able to trade up to, like, the 24th spot. But in terms of, like, top 10, that's not going to happen. I just don't see how that's going to happen. I mean, for example, if we look at, say, even Arizona's pick at 10, which they probably won't want to trade just for the sake of this example, of course, um, I want to find a pick that they'd actually be willing to move. Vancouver, please. All right, so nobody wants to move that pick anyway. What about Montreal? If Montreal doesn't want to move this pick, then I'm just going to stop looking. And they don't, but case in point, you know what? Screw it. The fact is that they're going to want even more value. You can see the difference in values there. Even if they want to trade the pick, we're talking a first and a second. It's just, it's not going to happen. So let's go ahead and sim as Rasmus Dahlin goes number one overall to the St. Louis Blues. The second pick is Svechnikov to the Islanders. The Sabres take, do, in fact, take Brady Kachuk, which means Zadina should go fourth. No, wow, Zadina is going to fall out of the top four, it's Kachuk and Adam Boakfast. So look out for Kale McCarr and Adam Boakfast in Colorado. Zadinia falls to fifth, where he goes to the Philadelphia Flyers. We have Joe Valeno to Detroit. Quinton Hughes to, wow, my God, Colorado. Hughes, Boakfast, and Kale McCarr. Jesus. That is an unreal defense core. You have Evan Bouchard to the Rangers. Bodie Wild to Detroit. Barrett Hayton goes in the top 10 to Arizona. And the reason why I'm going pick by pick is I want to see once we get to about the 20th selection who is still available. Oliver Wallstrom falls to 11th to the Canucks. Montreal takes Ryan Merkley. Uh, Noah Dobson to Edmonton. Arizona gets Gregory Denisenko. Solid addition there. Ty Smith to the Islanders. A lot of teams picking up some very Good depth here. Some impact players. Joel Farabee to Minnesota. Jared McIsaac to the Sharks. As we do get an off for Logan Brown. Not a chance in hell. Uh, Ryan McLeod goes to Washington. New Jersey takes Rasmus Kupari. And it's St. Louis again with the 20th pick. Now I want to see who is still available here. Is there anybody that I have my eyes on in that kind of first round territory? And the answer is not really. Roman, Kotkaniemi, Isaac Lundstrom. And I don't honestly remember how good Lundstrom and Kotkaniemi are. Kevin Ball, of course, is an enforcer just because he's medium top sixes in the first round because that's how this game works. Like I said, though, I have my eye on someone like Kravtsov. Who else do we have here that's kind of like that major game changer? Best goaltender in the draft, Alexis Gravel, but he's nothing too good. Put it this way, he's at least not medium starter. Like I said, second round, though. You have guys like Samuelson, Keandre Miller, Jet Wu, uh, Tychonic is also there. Benoit Garou, Akil Thomas. So there are guys in the second round worth getting. It's just, do I want to trade up here to make sure that I can get crafts off? Which... I think I'm going to risk it because there are players anyway. I'm not going to give up any assets here. So let's go ahead and sim to our pick. As we do get an offer, uh, Devin Shore and... Uh, it's Tom Pyatt, right? Not Taylor? I think it's Tom Pyatt. Devin Shore and Pyatt to Arizona for the 72nd overall pick here in the third round of this draft. Uh, number one, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I, I don't mind Tom Pyatt kind of as that fourth line option it's where he played this season but it may open up room to bring in someone else on the fourth line and do I plan on keeping him once his contract's up no I don't I mean 
In fairness, though, he is a kind of that ideal fourth line option. You heard me talk about Nick Moutry. I mean, looking at the attributes for Pyatt, that's not bad. That's not bad. And then Shore, who we just re-signed, 23 years old, well-rounded, but that offensive awareness concerns me. I'm not sure how much better he's or how much more he's going to improve in that aspect. I mean, this seems like a slam dunk of a pick, but I'm not sure who we're going to get in the third round. That's my issue. I mean, we have two strong NHL options here, at least in terms of bottom six. I'm not sure who's available in the third round. You know, I'm actually going to hold off on this for right now, which you might think I'm crazy, but allow me to see who's projected. There's Lauko, Lundqvist, Elonen, Kotkoff, Addison, Hollander. Lundstrom would have been a good addition, actually. Might have been worth trading up for Lundstrom. I can admit, medium top six out of 61. I didn't realize he was that good. You have Kotkaniemi and Ball. So Kravtsov is still there, though, which is tremendous for us. Uh, let me take a look at who is projected in the third round to see if this is worth pulling off this deal with Arizona. Again, if there's no one else who's that strong of an option, then what's really the point? But in the third round, you have Mo, Oliver Rodriguez, Kurashev, Kout, who's half option, who's half decent, Dominic Bach, David Lavin. There, there are actually some half decent names there. I'm thinking like a low top six potential guy, perhaps. So, is it worth giving up Shore and Pyatt to potentially get someone who might, in the future, be top six? I'd say so. So, let's go ahead and find both Pyatt and Shore. And I'll see if I can add a little bit more onto this, just because obviously the AI loves to kind of rip you off. So I'll go your third rounder this year, and you give me a fifth round pick next year as well. There we go. So Shore, who was a waiver pickup, and Tom Pyatt are off to Arizona for a third round pick. We'll see what kind of damage we can do with that. However, we do still have a pick here in the first round, 30th overall, and it's no surprise who I'm going to be taking here. I've already mentioned his name quite a bit. Vitaly Kravtsov is going to be our selection in this sim, we'll just say that hopefully he'll come over from the KHL. But yeah, he's uh, he's a good option. Why he doesn't get selected over a Lauko, I have no idea. That's just the way the game works. As the Blackhawks get the last pick of the first round and they go with Johansson. So we do get a bit of a steal there. Our next pick is 13th. And I gotta be honest, I'm thinking that I want to trade up. But I'm going to play it safe here because we got a lot of players in this portion of the draft that are very similar in terms of overall and potential. I'm talking about Seron Noel. I'm talking again about Samuelson, Keandre Miller, Jet Wu, Tychonic. That's five. There are six, seven guys here that I'd be really interested in getting. So we're going to pay attention to who gets drafted. Uh, we might not have to trade up to pull this off. Keandre Miller is off the board. Just a little bit disappointing. Uh, Keel Thomas is off the board. Uh, Saran Noel is the next up. I can move up in the draft, and you know what? I might as well. Noel is off the board. So that's already three out of the six that I was keeping eyes on. St. Louis, do you want to make a trade? Just so that I can make sure I get who I want here. Too many of them are going off the board. Uh, so we'll trade this pick. And we'll trade the sixth round pick that we have later on in this draft. How does that sound? Thank you very much. And we'll go out and get one of the players that we want. Of course, we took a forward in the first round. It might be worth taking someone like Samuelson or Jet Wu. So, and there's also Gravel. Again, if we wanted the best goaltender in this draft. But with Gustafson, I'm not really sure how big of a need we have for Gravel. But again, right here we have Matthias Samuelson, the six foot four, two way Swedish defenseman. We have Jet Wu, the only guy with a picture. <laughs> we have Tychonic, Johnny Tychonic, hell of a name, the offensive defenseman, which is intriguing. We also have Jack McBain and Benoit Garou. So I gotta be honest, again, I think I'm leaning towards a defenseman. We have. 
the Finnish Samuelson. We have Jet Wu, uh, who is also a two-way. He is also a two-way. And then there's Johnny Tychonic, or Tychonic, perhaps. Which, I'm kind of intrigued by the offensive defenseman. Now, of course, we've seen Jet Wu quite a bit in previous, you know, Sims. Samuelson's there, but Tychonic is one of the new additions to the game that I added in. And for that reason, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the offensive defenseman in Tychonic. He's low top four, 64 overall, but again, as an offensive defenseman, I'm intrigued to see what he can do. So we add Tychonic at this stage of the draft, unless it's Tychonic, which again, it could be. Uh, Colorado, they don't want to move this pick, which I'm fine with. My question is, again, we have a third, fourth, and two sevenths. There's really not much we can do here. I'd say even if a team wanted to trade that second rounder. So for now, we're good. Let's just move forward. Uh, Gustav Nyquist for our first rounder next year. No, thank you. Uh, our second next year and a seventh this year for Colin Wilson. No, thank you. Uh, first and seventh for Gustav. No. Yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to give up more to make that happen. Come on, Detroit. Kick rocks. Zach Smith for Andre Pavlik. No. I, I'm not against trading Zach Smith, but no, not for Andre Pavlik. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, Gravel was a medium starter, in fact. I didn't think he was that highly rated, but again, we already have a medium starter goaltender, and I wanted to go with Tychonic. Uh, you have Guru, Sandin, Alexiev. Again, Tychonic being an offensive defenseman, he, he does have that one slightly, uh, that one overall point difference, that slight difference. You have Samuelson, Jack McMahon, Jet Wu. Again, like I mentioned, here's the thing. If I stuck with my pick, 14th, with uh, New Jersey, I would have missed out on every single one of them. So I definitely made the right call in trading up there. Although Kavanaugh would have still been available. But I don't know. Maybe we should have gone with the goaltender. But then again, a low top 672 overall player. I'm not exactly upset about, uh, oh, about, you know, picking him. I am upset, though, about not moving up in the third round like I should have and missing out on that run of players, particularly someone like Dominic Bach. Is there one player left in the third round who's worth selecting? And the only guy I recognize here, well, we have Mo. Uh, we have Kalinchenko, which I'm not sure how good he is, to be honest. We have Harsh, hell of a name. Reese Harsh. Nice. Kurashev, Hare, Teasdale. We have Janis Jerome Moser. Although, I, yeah, I imagine there'd be a little bit of a French spin on that. And David Lavin. I think I'm going to go for Spencer Moe. Five foot seven sniper. But his name is Spencer Moe from the Prince Albert Raiders. So let's take Spencer Moe. Oh boy. Actually, he's worse than I thought he was. Well, you know, if you want to say I made a mistake. At any point in this episode, uh, getting distracted by Detroit bombarding me with trade offers for Gustav Nyquist and missing out on one of these three players would definitely have been that mistake. That is, of all my regret, I don't really have regrets for this episode, aside from that one. That was absolutely a mistake, and I should have been paying attention. Hello, New Jersey. Marion Gabrick for Nathan Bastion. Yeah, you know... I think I'm going to have to accept this. I think I am. They want to trade Bastion as well. Low tops. Jesus, what are you thinking, New Jersey? You know what? I can't accept this trade in its current state. I can't. I feel bad about it. I can't accept it. So what I am going to do is I'm going to retain salary on Marion Gabrick. I, I cannot accept that in its current state. I just can't. I will, I will hold or reserve some of that salary. I'll retain that salary. That's the correct word for it. And I will also give you the Pittsburgh third round pick next year. Just because I feel bad about it. You know what? Here, if it makes if it makes anybody feel any better, you can give me your sixth round pick next year. I just don't feel right about trading Marion Cabrick to New Jersey straight up for a solid prospect. It's just not right. I'm going to make it right. We'll retain salary on Gabrick and give you a pick as our way of saying, for the love of God, take Marion Gabrick. And, oh, look, you're so nice. You're giving us back Nathan Bastion. Although, uh, who else did they want to trade? 
you know what? I'm good with it. I'm good with it. Nathan Bastion, welcome to Ottawa. Mary and Gabrick, have fun in New Jersey. Although we are retaining salary because I'm a very nice guy. Uh, two sevenths for a sixth, we'll absolutely do that, just to get rid of those. Thomas Shabbat for Jack Roslovich, absolutely not. Cody CC, two San Jose for Maxime Latunov, a third and a fifth. The third round pick is next year. Now, I know there are some people who are going to be watching this series who are not very big fans of Cody CC, And I get it. Latunov, though, is 22 years old and only a 71. That's, that's, not, that's not the right trade if we're going to move him. A first and a second for Brody. No. Absolutely not. Now, as far as the rest of this draft goes, I mean... You know, there are going to be some familiar names in terms of just if you pay attention to the you know, junior leagues. After this round, though, I'm not going to be looking through. Connor Walchuk was computer generated. That's nice to know. That's nice to know. So definitely uh, not trading up at the start of the third round is one of my regrets. Had I at least ended up, if not my only regret, uh, had I ended up with one of the low top six players, I, I'd at least feel good about myself for missing out on the medium elite guy. Uh, now the question is, who the hell do we go for here in the fourth round? Not that I even necessarily want to make this pick, but let's just see who we end up with for the hell of it. Um, let's let's sort this out. Although Linus Neiman is there, a squeaky chair makes its presence known. Yeah, there's really no there's really no guarantees. I mean, especially too for the first year draft. You know what? Every good team needs a Finn named Linus, right? Look at that hairline. You're telling me that this guy isn't going to be a good addition to this team? I don't believe you. Linus, you're only medium bottom six, but damn it, your name is Linus. Welcome to the team. Cody CC for Anthony Stolarz and Dale Weiss. I'm going to say no. Thomas Shabbat for Dennis Gurionov. Absolutely not. Cody CC for Stolarz and Raffle. No. I don't really want Stolars, even though it might be a decent idea. Logan Brown for Anderson Dolan. Absolutely not. Shabbat and Clayson for a first. Get out of my face. Colin White for Brook. Stop it. Shabbat for Rosovich and Hutchinson. No. And that brings us to the sixth round. Neat. Some of those offers are just like, it's, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Let's take a look here at who is available. We have a guy named Gross. Nico Gross. It might be Gross because he's Swedish. Who knows? Or Swedish. Swiss. Swiss. <sighs> I'm losing my mind. I know what the Swiss flag looks like. Stop it. Home of Cesaro and Nico Hischier. Perbu. I should draft Cole uh, Perbu just for the just for the references. Although to just make people set Shaw Boomhauer. <laughs> yep, taking Shaw Boomhauer. Shaw, welcome to the team. You're an absolute legend. You still follow me on Twitter for whatever reason. We're taking Shaw Boomhauer. I am not trading Chalapic for Mitch Stevens. Thank you very much. First for Giordano, absolutely not. Thomas Shabbat for Beauvillier and Grice, absolutely not. Duchesne, hello. Duchesne and Zach Smith for two first round picks and I couldn't. Now here's the thing, Montreal missed the playoffs, Anaheim did not. 68 overall, low top six. Oh boy, Matt Duchesne though, I feel like Matt Duchesne has to be here. But I'm also concerned that he's not going to want to sign a very team friendly contract when he leaves. That is one of the bigger questions as well. Not only what do we do with Eric Carlson heading into year two, what the hell do we do with Matt Duchesne? And I mean, Zach Smith, Strong bottom six guy. The contract's a bit rough, though. I'm going to say no for now, but that does raise the question as to what we do with Matt Duchesne as well, as I'll continue to reject all these repeat offers. They're obviously not going to happen. Brown and Burrow. Oh, man. that's You know how badly I want to get rid of Burrows, but I'm not going to sacrifice Logan Brown to do it. I'm also still not going to acquire Mark Giordano. None of these deals are interesting. Again, how many times are they going to offer Smith for Pavlik? Like, it's just, it's not going to happen. Stop it. Just stop it. 
as we end up with two very solid prospects in terms of Kravtsov uh, and Tychonik. Mo Neiman, eh, but we got Shaw Boomhauer, who is an absolute legend and future AHL captain. So I'm cool with it. And my, my references to Purbo, of course, would have been uh, the Be A Pro series. That was a thing for like five episodes once upon a time, because I'm not a big fan of Be A Pro. But with that, and considering we're over an hour into this, I think now is probably the ideal time to call it quits on this episode as we went through the trade deadline. The Chicago Blackhawks won the Stanley Cup yet again. We end up adding a couple of decent players in the draft, but of course missing our actual first round pick hurt us quite a bit. We have $13 million in cap space to work with, and in terms of expiring deals, I mean, I might bring back Clayson and Paterin. Everybody else can go except for Robertson, who we're not even going to sign until next year, so it's fine. Dreger's going to go. I don't need to worry about signing Halat. So there's not really a whole hell of a lot of work that needs to be done with this team in terms of the re-sign phase. The big thing will be free agency, what prospects we can look to bring in, what kind of development we get of the prospects we already have on this team heading in to season two. And at the very least, at the very least, we do have our draft pick, at least our number one draft pick, our first round draft pick heading into next season. The question is though, Eric Carlson, Matt Duchesne, what do we look to do? Do we wait to see how good of a team we are before potentially making a move at the deadline? Big, big decisions coming up here as we, of course, are still in the very early stages of this series. But guys, I appreciate you checking out this entire episode. I appreciate your support on this series. I thank you oh so much. As we bring this episode to a close, again, I have to remind you, like all YouTubers do, or even the ones who do it like I do, where they're sarcastic, being like, oh, I guess I have to say like and subscribe because everyone else does, they still mean it, and so do I. If you would, if you haven't already, if you enjoyed the episode, leave a like and subscribe if you have not, again, already done so. I'd also, again, recommend clicking the little notification bell because YouTube sucks at letting you know and everybody know as far as, hey, you know that YouTuber you subscribe to? Well, he uploaded a video six days ago, but we're not going to tell you about it. That happens because it's YouTube. So I recommend hitting that notification bell and following me on Twitter if you have not already done so. It's a pretty good idea. Of course, the link to my Twitch channel is also in the description. Again, I thank you for watching this video. I thank you for supporting the series and supporting me and Emmy, leading to the Emmy Dog Treat Foundation. All in all, anytime you watch a video, whether or not you donate directly on Twitch or sub on Twitch, whatever else, it all pretty much goes to the Emmy Dog Treat Foundation. So at least feel good about yourself uh, for that. Anyway, I'll stop rambling. I love you all. Goodbye for now.